have to have everybody adhere to it. And you have a certain side that uh, almost pretends it doesn't exist, pretty much pretends it doesn't exist. So unless we're going to have something that we all agree to, we can't be put at the disadvantage of going by a treaty, limiting what we do when somebody else doesn't go by that treaty. Our American partners stated they will stop their participation in the treaty, so we will also stop. They stated that they will do research and development of arms, so we will also do the same. President Trump and President Putin announcing their intention to withdraw in six months from the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, banning short- and medium-range missiles capable of carrying conventional or nuclear warheads. This uh, first meeting between Russia and NATO has been, to my mind, a great success. The former Secretary General of NATO, Javier Solana, presided over the first joint meeting between Russia and NATO in 1997, manifesting the end of the Cold War era. He also served as EU foreign policy chief, dealing with burning issues affecting European security and military matters at the time, such as the war in Kosovo in 1999. Do you think that President Trump made the right decision? No, I don't think he made the right decision. He is one of the most experienced European diplomats, and he is concerned about the consequences of the Trump and Putin announcements. I'm worried, to tell you the truth, very worried. Today, he talks to Al Jazeera. For years, Russia has violated the terms of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty without remorse. The United States will therefore suspend its obligations under the INF Treaty, effective February 2nd. The decision by Washington and Moscow in early February to quit the treaty had been in the works for some time. Nevertheless, the implications for the global balance of power can be very serious. According to the official American version, President Trump made his decision after Russia developed a class of missiles called SSC-8 that Americans say is banned by the agreement. What did the Russians do wrong? Because this is something that President Obama had already brought up. There was already, he voiced his um, discontent, would I say, uh, with Moscow, and then President Trump took this uh, bold step. What, what did the Russians actually do? Well, um, let's suppose that uh, the Russians have produced a new uh, missile or a new, uh, yes, a new missile that uh, it can operate uh, among the range of the intermediate uh, uh, contract. Mm. I we have to be very sure that that is the case. They don't. They say that they don't. Um, so to 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 react with the let me say with the heaviest reaction, the nuclear reaction to the nuclear problem, is 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 playing with the last card. So I don't think we should play with the last card uh, on nuclear matters. We have to, to, to play with, uh, we don't have to play, but we have to discuss, debate, uh, talk until the very, very end. And, uh, and I think we should have done the utmost to have uh, the machine of the, of the, of the Russians to be, be seen, analyzed. I have asked for really analyzing the machine at the, at the very, at the very, at the very, just to the very end, uh, before uh, taking this decision. Because we are kind of witnessing a tit-for-tat action-reaction. President Trump makes one announcement, then President Vladimir Putin says, well, in that case, we're pulling out two, and we're going to go ahead with our uh, plans. This tit-for-tat is, is, is for kids to play about other things, but not to, to really important politicians uh, playing for serious things. The INF Treaty was signed by US President Ronald Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev in 1987. It was the result of high-stakes diplomacy and military maneuvers, threatening to reignite the Cold War, which was already waning at that point. It all started in 1976, 
when the Soviet Union placed SS-20 missiles on its territory, capable of carrying nuclear warheads with a range of about 5,000 kilometers. Unlike intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of reaching the United States, the SS-20 missile was designed to reach targets mainly in Europe. But at that time, Western Europe had no similar weapons capable of reaching the Soviet Union and therefore was unable to restore military balance. Nobody wants that back. No European wants to have nuclear weapons again. It's, 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 so it's, it's something that uh, has consequences, as you said, for third countries like the European Union in this case. The German leader at the time, Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, pleaded with the United States to counter the move. Initially hesitant, the Americans started negotiating with the Soviets, hoping to reach an agreement. But with no progress, the Reagan administration moved to deploy American medium-range missiles, the Pershing II, to Western Europe. Not everyone welcomed the move. While the political leadership was in agreement, some in Berlin and London took to the streets protesting the deployment of American missiles. This is the movement of the people with the sense to know that nuclear weapons are made by human beings. Nuclear weapons must be dismantled by human beings. That is the cause of common sense. Unable to keep up with a costly arms race, the Soviet Union backed down and signed the INF treaty with the US. It had taken almost 10 years. The numbers alone demonstrate the value of this agreement. On the Soviet side, over 1,500 deployed warheads will be removed, and all ground-launched intermediate-range missiles, including the SS-20s, will be destroyed. On our side, our entire complement of Pershing II and ground-launched cruise missiles, with some 400 deployed warheads, will all be destroyed. The agreement, like all agreements between two parties, required a basic trust between the two superpowers. But it went only so far. We have listened to the wisdom of, in an old Russian maxim, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. My, Mr. General Secretary, though my pronunciation may give you difficulty, the maxim is dovayai no provayai, trust but verify. <laughs> and now, is there any of that trust left? It's a break in trust, but... It's also, I'm supposing that that treaty in the first place took a lot of hard work to bring yes, the two sides yes, together. Yes. So, and it was very after difficult. That, if it really breaks, would it be realistic to think that these two parties and others would sit together in one room? Let me go again. We have nuclear problems reopened. We had solved a nuclear problem with Iran. And I participated very much in that. And it was resolved that the United States went back. So it's another issue that is open. Now we are trying to see how we resolve it. But look at what the Europeans are doing today. The Europeans are doing today of that second case of nuclear material, nuclear, in the world, that was resolved in a positive manner by talking. By talking and talking and talking, it put a lot of time. It was very difficult until President Obama. It was not resolved, and uh, then it was unresolved by President Trump. Today, the Secretary General of NATO is Jens Stoltenberg. He welcomed the move by President Trump. He said, "Quote: Russia is in material breach of the INF Treaty and must use the next six months to return to full and verifiable compliance." or bear sole responsibility for its demise. NATO fully supports the U.S. suspension and notification of withdrawal from the treaty. NATO Secretary General, Mr. Stoltenberg, seemed to have quite a welcoming statement uh, about uh, the, the move 
by the Trump administration to temporarily suspend uh, the INF. But I'm wondering, in Berlin, in Paris, in other European capitals, people must be worried and wondering what's yes. going to happen next. Yes, because, I mean, uh, the Secretary General of NATO welcome because he assumes that it's impossible to change the mind of Russia. And, um, well, I am a little bit of a different position. I think that uh, we have to do much more in order to, to try to, to, to try to, to achieve, if possible, to stop this new step in the wrong direction on nuclear proliferation, in a way. Well, this is what it is. But this is the type of thing that in the 2000 and the year that we're living in the 21st century should not happen. The INF dispute comes in the middle of political tension between President Trump and some European leaders. First, in November 2018, French President Emmanuel Macron, followed by German Chancellor Angela Merkel, said it was time for Europe to create its own army, implying American military support could no longer be taken for granted. We have great progress in the structured cooperation in the military sphere. That is good and will be supported here further. Aber wir sollten, das sage ich sehr bewusst auch aus der Entwicklung der letzten Jahre, wir sollten an der Vision arbeiten, eines Tages auch eine echte europäische Armee zu schaffen. Quand je regarde le monde où nous vivons, l'Europe est de plus en plus fracturée. Quand je regarde le monde où nous vivons, vous avez des puissances autoritaires qui réémergent et qui se réarment aux confins de l'Europe. Nous sommes bousculés par les tentatives d'intrusion dans le, le cyberespace. Et l'intervention, d'ailleurs, dans notre vie démocratique de plusieurs. Nous, nous devons nous protéger à l'égard de la Chine, de la Russie et même des États-Unis d'Amérique. Quand je vois le président Trump annoncer, il y a quelques semaines, le fait qu'il sorte d'un grand traité de désarmement qui avait été pris, je le rappelle, après la crise des euromissiles, au milieu des années 80, qui avait frappé l'Europe. Mm -hmm. Qui en est la victime principale L'Europe et sa sécurité. On ne protégera pas les Européens si on ne décide pas d'avoir une vraie armée européenne. Face à la Russie qui est à nos frontières et qui a montré qu'elle pouvait être menaçante, moi je veux construire un vrai dialogue de sécurité avec la Russie, qui est un pays que je respecte, qui est européen. Une armée Mais européenne. on doit avoir une Europe qui se défend davantage seule et sans dépendre seulement des États-Unis et de manière plus souveraine. You think that President Macron of France has a point when he says the Europeans uh, should create their own army? I think we have. We we need to have the Europeans more European capabilities. I mean, I, I, I don't, I'm not looking so much in, and I don't want to call it an army. I don't see the European Union marching on uh, after the flag of the European Union. No, I don't see that. But I see very clearly that we have to be much more interoperable and much more integrated our capabilities. And we have the possibility of acting, acting uh, in a strategic manner alone. Whenever Maybe we, more military right, independence? Right. Among the Europeans, intra-European intra security, much more uh, interconnected, which means to produce, for instance, weapons uh, which uh, are not, uh, not... Germany should not buy um, weapons in Russia, or in the United States, or in China, eventually. But to have to construct all this within the European Union. So I believe that the European Union has to have European capabilities. So you said you believed in that for a, quite a while now. Yes. In today's world, with what we're seeing, all these international agreements, fragile, falling apart, being suspended, do you think it's become a priority for Europe? For Europe it's a priority, yes. It's a priority to be able to get the possibility of defending itself or acting ourselves, the European Union will never go to war as, Europe, as, a Europe, as a country. This is not the case. But we have to defend ourselves and uh, we have to be ready uh, to respond uh, autonomously when somebody takes decisions with affect us. But there's another side of the story. The INF has until now effectively limited the ability of the U.S. to counter moves by other nations 
to develop and place short or medium range missiles around the world. When the agreement was signed, for example, China was still a developing nation with a small economy. It had nuclear weapons, but its conventional military was limited. And it's not a party to the INF. Today, China is the largest economy in the world and its military might is growing. It includes short and medium range missiles. North Korea and Iran have also developed similar weapons, leaving the INF would, in theory, free up the U.S. to counter these rising military powers more effectively. Another way to see it, it could potentially ignite an arms race. But Trump says he wants a new and improved agreement. Maybe the INF should have been updated, should have... Okay. Um, I mean, for, for the... For most of the countries, I think that the, the treaty was a treaty that uh, I wouldn't say was forgotten, but nobody imagined, uh, naively maybe, that that uh, treaty would change. Because as I said, it's a treaty that becomes, or makes the nuclear matter something much more dangerous because it's the short range or the medium range use of nuclear weapons. And imagine if we continue on that path, and you go to, to have a use of nuclear weapons even for a shorter range. I mean, really, the world, it, uh, you can use nuclear weapons for uh, things that um, they will be really dramatic for the world and without the capacity to really respond, etc., which is the deterrent is really what the nuclear weapon does. Uh, so I think it's, uh, I, I'm very, very, very sad that that uh, looks so, so bad. But is I it think sad it still have only possible. or dangerous as well? Dangerous as well, yeah. The, 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 the mere fact of having uh, play with the distance, by, um, by this maybe the Russians or for the Americans maybe to get out of the treaty, is a sign of a dramatic breaking of, of, of a strategic trust, which I, I'm, I'm sorry, I am very fond of and this the expression. the world order as we know it since we were born, basically. Right. Uh, the, 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 there are things that we have the possibility uh, even risking something to move from here to there, but there are things that we should not touch. First of all, you have to add countries, obviously, it's old, but very importantly, one side has not been adhering to it. We have, but one side hasn't. So unless they're going to adhere, we shouldn't be the only one. Uh, I hope that we're able to get everybody in a very big and beautiful room and do a new treaty that would be much better. But, because uh, certainly I would like to see that. But you have to have everybody adhere to it. And you have a certain side that uh, almost pretends it doesn't exist, pretty much pretends it doesn't exist. So unless we're going to have something that we all agree to, we can't be put at the disadvantage of going by a treaty, limiting what we do when somebody else doesn't go by that treaty. President Trump said that he is open to a new meeting, in his words, in a big room with more participants. Presumably, uh, he is thinking, among others, about uh, China. But how realistic is that? It must be very difficult to bring that kind of treaty about. Now, look at the moment. We have big public goods that have to be respected and provided and provided by those who can provide it, which is the international community, stability. But uh, nuclear, climate change, nuclear weapons, climate change, um, poverty is still, uh, are issues that uh, cannot, uh, that we cannot make a mistake in the way I approach them. And to break them, it's a very serious uh, break. I think that we are playing at a very risky decision. I think that the, the, the negotiations should have continued. And uh, it's very risky what they do. To really end, end with one of the pillars 
of the end of the Cold War, which is this treaty, is a risky, risky situation, risky thing to do. Because think about, uh, about uh, Asia. I mean, in Asia, that treaty is what has allowed uh, never to have a tension in the nuclear level between the Japan and China or between uh, China and, and Vietnam, uh, something like that, nuclearly, nuclearly. And now we open another uh, situation, another condition whereby this type of thing may happen also in Asia. So we enter into a completely different uh, uh, line in the nuclear domain. The Russians displaying their military power. These weapons have been used by the Russians in the war in Syria, leading to this question. Could the end of the INF Treaty impact regional conflicts around the world, and not just the overall balance of power between the two superpowers? There are zones of conflicts in this world where Russia and the US are there, each pulling their own strings. Ukraine comes to mind, Syria comes to mind. When but Syria and Ukraine are not the same. Yes, they're not the same conflict, but both sides have interest in yes, those countries. Yes. When you reach a point where the diplomatic relations are so tense and the threat of breaking up treaties, would that have an impact on what is happening on the ground, on the dynamic on, of the fighting on the ground in Ukraine or, or in any other place? Well, no doubt that everything, every decision that has a military impact gets uh, the actual conflict more, in, more intense if the countries which have created the problem are also involved in that uh, third, third conflict. And uh, Ukraine, uh, I mean, the problem of Ukraine, Russia is, 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 is clearly there, and the European Union are clearly there. Um, and uh, in Syria, Russia is clearly there. The United States is clearly there, but they are saying that they are going out, or they're going to, re to remove at least the, tr the troops on the, on the ground, or troops uh, in, in, direct, uh, in direct contact with uh, Syria. So, um, it's not the same, it's exactly the same. And in any case, I think that um, if we reopen at the same time a question pertaining to nuclear of this treaty that we're talking about, and uh, the Iran issue may be reopened uh, and the sanctions may be applied in a, in a short period of time, I think we enter into unknown territory. If you put that together with uh, an economy which is not going uh, at the speed, with this decreasing the speed of growth, I mean, the, the, you put all these things together, it's absurd. In the, 20th, in the 21st century, which objectively, objectively could be a very good century, a very good century, century in which uh, the life expectancy is going skyrocketing, fantastic, with poverty is being diminished, uh, all these things which are good are taking place. At the same time, to put all this at risk for something which is not objectively sound. Well, we have six months to see where yeah. this is all heading. Well, I hope, I hope that it's still... I mean, it's good that we have this conversation because and, uh, I hope we, we have many more conversations like this to put the topic on the table with the dimension that it has. Thank you very much, Mr. Javier Solana. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. It's a pleasure.